Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kimberly Belmonte, Vice President of the Girl Scout Research Institute at Girl Scouts of the USA, and I'm so excited to open this Campfire Chat, a new decade of leadership. First, let me introduce the Girl Scout Network. We're a community of adults, Girl Scout alums, and supporters from across the country who feel passionately about supporting girls and one another. If you're reconnecting with us now or connecting for the first time, welcome to the Girl Scout community. During these campfire chats, successful women, many of whom are Girl Scout alums, share their stories to both educate and inspire. And now I'd like to share a little about a new Girl Scout Research Institute study, a new decade of girls leadership, made possible by the David and Laura Lovell Foundation. For over two decades, the Girl Scout Research Institute has conducted original research on girls' well-being and leadership with studies that elevate, elevate girls' voices on issues that they care about. This groundbreaking research examines girls' thoughts and beliefs about gender, politics, and civic engagement, and finds that girls overwhelmingly hold egalitarian views about leadership. They desire more equal gender representation in Congress, and they want to shatter the glass ceiling by electing a woman as president. Girls are also clear on what it will take to prepare the next generation of leaders to, to close the gender gap. We need to encourage them to to think of themselves as leaders, we need to teach all children, including boys, about the importance of gender equality and making space for women and girls. And we need to connect girls with role models who encourage them and provide opportunities to practice leadership. And looking to the future, what we found in this research is that 82% of girls want to make a positive impact on society through their careers. And nearly all girls have high expectations around gender parity when it comes to their careers. 87% say that it's important that employees are paid equally, regardless of gender. And 86% think it's important that in their future workplace, everyone is treated equally. We're excited to share that in the next part of this research, we're going to delve even deeper into how girls define, experience, and aspire towards leadership in their current and their future lives. The truly exciting findings of this research that are a uh, really unique look at how Gen Z understands leadership. Girls say in this research that a leader is someone who brings people together, stands up for their beliefs and values, and changes the world for the better, which suggests that this next generation of girls is defining leadership in terms of what you do and the impact you make. In June, we'll share additional insight into what hinders and encourages girls and how we can champion their leadership goals. So now I'd like to extend a special welcome to the current Girl Scout ambassadors and seniors in the audience. We can't wait to welcome you into the Girl Scout network when you graduate Girl Scouts and become alums. We're sharing information about the leadership development opportunity our, that is our Gold Award program in the chat log, so keep an eye out for those links. And one more thing before we get started. We'll be monitoring the chat log and sharing your questions with the panelists, so don't be afraid to ask away. And if you're inclined to share what you've learned, please tag any social posts with hashtag Campfire Chats and at Girl Scouts. To watch this event with live captioning, please use the link in the chat. And now I'm thrilled to introduce you to the moderator of our panel discussion, Girl Scout alum, Jolene Kent, who's a correspondent for NBC News. So over to you, Joe. Kimberly, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It is an honor to be here. I'm JoLynn Ken, NBC News Business and Technology Correspondent. I cover the economy as well for the Today Show, NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, and MSNBC in all of our digital platforms. And I'm so proud to be here to moderate this Girl Scout Network Campfire Chat on the state of women and leadership. We have today a phenomenal panel of Girl Scout alums who are all leaders from across a wide variety of industries. First, Olympic athlete and maternity leave rights advocate Alicia Montano, Rochelle Roche Walton, a cyber intelligence in intelligence analyst for the FBI, and Anne Lovell, who has worked in the accounting industry for three decades and advocates for women from a variety of boards and philanthropic positions. Everyone, welcome. It's great to have you all here. Um, so let's, we're gonna start, uh, first of all, by talking about your careers and your Girl Scout experience. I'll start very briefly by saying that I was a, 
Daisy and a brownie very briefly. I was very, very, I remember loving selling Girl Scout cookies in my community in Northern California. Um, I got into journalism while I was a Fulbright scholar living in China, covering and researching women's rights issues. And the reason I got into journalism is actually because of the inequality that women face, especially in the courtroom when it comes to discrimination and human rights violations. And I found myself entering a very male-dominated dominated field, which is a newsroom as in pre-COVID days, um, but very encouraged to see that diversity and gender equality has started to uh, become a priority uh, across the board for, for journalism, both in TV and digital and print. So that is my story. Alicia, I'm going to start with you. Tell us about your Girl Scout experience and a little bit about, about yourself. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. First, it's happy Equal Pay Day. Let's talk about that. <laughs> um, my name is Alicia Montano. I'm an Olympic athlete. I am a, an author of a book called Feel Good Fitness. I am a podcast host called Keeping Track. I mean, it's about sharing uh, women's stories, lesser known stories in sports. As we know, women's stories are only shared 4% in the sports world, which is just like 100%, by the way, everybody is like 100%. 4%. Um, and I have founded a nonprofit organization called And Mother, which is helping break down the barriers that limit a woman's choice of pursuing and thriving in both her career and in her motherhood. And, you know, I very much believe that in order to reach gender parity, we, we have to start with the most expansive group, which is our moms. You know, we need to start from the bottom and know that, like, if we add women within the structure of everything that we do, and then we add the moms within everything that we do, society's just gonna be better. So um, I was a brownie in, the, um, in elementary school, I was a brownie, and one of my favorite memories I have um, in being a brownie is one, just the camaraderie, that closeness, but also it, it kind of is similar to sports. There's a lot of teamwork that's involved in allowing us to be our better version of ourselves. So um, I'm so thankful to be an alum and I hope that everybody is enjoying their experience um, a part of the Girl Scouts team. Anne. Well, my, my thank you again for being here and all of you, what great company to be with. Um, I was a Brownie Scout and loved it um, for a lot of the reasons that Alicia said. I felt a real team, a real camaraderie with it but there weren't enough leaders in my area, so the troop dis was dismissed. And that's the reason that I became a leader for my daughter's troop. And I was a leader for her group, and now my granddaughter is a Brownie Scout selling Girl Scout cookies. So it has been quite, quite an experience all the way through. And I would have to say that the experience of even being a Scout leader was a part of the formation of my own leadership. So it's, it, it's, it's a payback in all ways. Um, I am a CPA. I was one of those people that didn't start out that way. I didn't go to college right away. And, but I did start out with bookkeeping positions and found that I was exceptionally good at it, but didn't love it. So I tried lots and lots of other things and then went back to school thinking, well, accounting's got a good pay ratio. <laughs> And you know, got my degree and went on and formed a, a firm with another woman CPA, and we're still at it today. In my philanthropic realm, I've worked for more than 30 years trying to advance women's rights and to really change the world for women and girls to give more equal opportunities across the board because I knew what I had faced in my early careers, and I never wanted to see anyone be pulled down by not having the opportunities or not being treated respectfully. So. And thank you, and Alicia, thank you. Uh, Rochelle, please go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm so excited to be here with you all. Well, my um, leadership experience began in Southeast Louisiana and present day Girl Scouts Louisiana East. And in High school, I developed a, a love of public policy and governance and public service. 
And uh, in college, I, um, I became a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and I had been engaged in sisterhood, scholarship, and service for over 28 years. Um, but it's given me the distinct privilege of having amazing female role models my entire life, really. Um, professionally, my skills and interests that I developed as a Girl Scout um, led me to a career with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, I'm, an, I'm a cyber intelligence analyst, as, as Joe mentioned, and I really embrace daily the challenges of my role and my part in accomplishing the FBI's mission. In fact, um, the FBI's core values, including leadership, respect, fairness, compassion, and integrity mirror the lessons I learned as a Girl Scout. Um, my service with the Girl Scout movement started about 19 years ago, uh, and perhaps the most unique part of my story is that my family and I lived in Paris for five years and I had the honor of serving as the board chair of Girl Scouts overseas. Um, the overseas mission of Girl Scouts is amazing. You know, it reaches girls in over 90 countries whose families are part of um, the military, the expat community, and the foreign service. And it is such a pleasure to serve girls across the country and around the world. Currently, I serve as a member of the Girl Scouts National Board of Directors, and I have to tell you, this is a very exciting time for girls and women, and I am so proud of the essential work that we're doing as an organization. So thank you so much for, for having me. All of you, thank you so much for your insights, your service, and your dedication to women and girls all around the world. Um, I want to get started by talking about the state of the situation today, building off of what Rochelle was just talking about. We know that over the past you know, half century, American women have made these big strides, right? Education, entry into the workforce. But despite these advances, women continue to be underrepresented in top leadership positions. Uh, so while we're seeing a record number of women serving in these leadership roles today, they still represent a really small amount of the top, top roles. So I want to talk about glass ceilings. That's basically it and limiting factors that are still very much entrenched. And I want to talk about how we get through them. How do we smash through them and bring other women with us? So Alicia, I want to start with you first. How do you think things have changed in the last decade, given your experience across multiple industries? And what do you see as like the number one barrier that remains for women who are trying to break this new ground? Well, as I'll start with, I mean, I'm in the sports world, yeah. right? And so what I've seen has changed a lot is not only are we not wanting to be like Mike, we're able to... <laughs> Mike, no, no, no big deal. We love you too. Um, um, but we're recognizing that women in leadership really does matter. We have a different experience to bring to the table. And that's really what matters in bettering our communities, right? Having different experience, diverse experiences, and inclusive experiences. And if we leave out women, think of that amount of people you are leaving out from, you know, making things better. And so in the last 10 years, I would really say we have had an opportunity of not only having our young girls, but our young boys see and um, be able to look up to women in leadership positions. We've been, we're still chipping away. We have a lot, a long, long, long ways to go, but at least we've been able to have these platforms and where we're, we've been able to share our stories and we've been able to talk about about the importance of having women in leadership positions. We've been talking about why it's important for us to have uh, gender parity, why it's important for our you know, parents across the board to also, if they have young boys, to also have them looking towards uh, women for um, you know, their expertise and the things that they have to offer. And it's not just boys looking towards boys and girls looking towards, well, to be honest, when I was growing up, it was really like, let's look at all the, all the men and want to be like them. And I'm like, but I want to be one like me, but also I want to see more people like myself. Um, and, you know, I think we do have a long ways to go. Just to answer your question about like where, like what are things that we can do to get to where we want to be? I think one is we need our men to get off the bench. <laughs> and I just need to say that quite frankly, um, we, I, 
again, my nonprofit organization is about breaking down barriers that limit a woman's choice from pursuing and thriving in her career and in her motherhood. And we need this, this, these barriers that we're breaking, not to just be about us trying to bust down these doors. It's like, also, let's have allyship and where people that aren't us that are saying like, yeah, what are we doing? Like, I know this person. I know Alicia. I know Rochelle. I know Anne. I know, like, I know Joe. They, they're amazing. All that they have to afford. Can you imagine leaving them out of this space? So um, for what we've got to do, we really do have to think about how we are serving our community in a greater way, how we're including one another, how we're listening to each other's stories, how we're learning from them and how we're acting as active members in our community and what our role is in making sure we're bettering the future for um, the generations to come. Absolutely. And Rochelle, I, on the same note, you know, what roadblocks have you seen uh, at the FBI or around the FBI or in, in your cybersecurity analyst universe, right, which is many different organizations, in the way of women trying to break these glass ceilings, both in government and then, of course, in the private sector? So that's an interesting concept, glass ceilings. You know, it dates back um, to the 1970s, and that's uh, five decades. You know, it's a <laughs> metaphor that refers to the invisible barriers that prevent women from advancing in their careers. The barriers are often unwritten and accepted, and they're based on accepted norms rather than defined policies. You know, Elise said, you know, there's a lot of work to do, and she's right, but we're making progress in, in some respects uh, in the private sector and in government, I believe. You know, institutions are taking a hard look at what gets in the way of hiring and promoting women in their organizations, and many of them are giving eligible women serious consideration. So that's that's a plus. But to completely dismantle the metaphorical glass ceiling, women and girls and those who support them, their allies, must name, claim, and reframe the evolving narrative. You know, they must name the obstacles that perpetuate gender inequality, because once you call it out, the practice or the policy or behavior, and name it, the barrier is no longer invisible. Women must assert their rightful place in leadership. Stake your claim, lead with intent, and exercise your agency. Most importantly, women and girls must reframe the narrative around leadership. We get to decide how we want to lead, understanding that leadership is more important than a title or a role. It's empowering others, taking initiative, acting with resilience, practicing, practicing self-development, and driving results, and acting with integrity. So I think you know that's a big part of it, but we get to decide whether it's the private sector or government or small business. You know, we get to decide what leadership looks like, and we need to take advantage of that in order to to change the tide. What would you, since we're talking about naming obstacles here, and I think that is I just wrote it down. It was like name it, state your claim. Rochelle, what is one obstacle in your world that you would name that still is very much an issue? So I'll have to speak for myself personally. Um, yeah. you know, for me, part of it was believing the gender stereotypes as a girl. Um, you know, I, I loved math. I was never very good at it. <laughs> However, you know, it, it, it prevented me from pursuing a you know, a career um, early on in a STEM field. In fact, I got into cybersecurity because I was truly interested, you know, in my 40s. And so that was a part of you, we're believing the narrative that is out there and we need to change it. You know, um, and that's, and I think a lot of us buy into, you know, falsehoods, um, but we get to determine, you know, what our leadership looks like and our institutions should look like the, the, the communities they represent. And I think we have to, you know, hold institutions accountable. And, and I've got to say, you know, at the FBI, you know, there is to a large extent, you know, efforts to be inclusive and diverse. And I think, you know, where we're going is, you know, trying to holistically create a sense of belonging. And I think that is what's critical. 
And we, Rochelle brings up STEM, and we do know that one of the final frontiers of female leadership has been STEM. And women today only make up about 28% of the science and engineering workforce, mathematics, and the entire field. And so you, the majority of your career has been in accounting, which is a key STEM field that so many of us are touched by in our everyday lives. And one that can be quite traditional, as you pointed out at the beginning of your introduction. So do you have experiences that kind of mirror what um, Alicia and Rochelle have said? And what, tell us a little bit more about being a woman in the STEM field, starting your firm with another woman, what have been some of the most acute challenges? Well, I think the reason that we started the firm that we started was because there wasn't enough space in the in the organizations we had access to to be able to raise our children and do our job well. Mm -hmm. We need a more flexible time. Yes, you can work 50, 60 hours a week as long as you can space it and work it around different, you know, different times of day, work around your children because the children were number one. So how did how did you figure out that space? The other thing was that, you know, in recent years we've become much more aware of harassment at a job site. And I grew up and be, you know, went into practice, went into everything, not even realizing how little respect I would receive for wow. being a girl and how those lines might be encroached upon at any term. So in my early careers, um, I spent an awful lot of my time and energy trying to avoid situations that would put me in a bad circumstance. That's mm -hmm. an enormous amount of energy expended for no good purpose as far as production in a job. I think some of the good news lately is that we're so aware of that happening now with the Me Too movement and, and the Time's Up that things the awareness starts to change things. It, I think it really, we've become so aware that, that you have to be safe to soar. You have to, you have to feel like you're, you're important in your space. You know, I created my own space to feel that. Mm -hmm. But I think the same thing in leadership, it, you know, the, a leader is really somebody that brings up others with them. They're, they're somebody that are, that's effective, efficient, brings people together, and, and rewards them for the job that's done. But overall, even men working for women, if you're productive and the company does well and they reap the benefits, there becomes a lot less of the push. So, you know, the argument for things like equal pay is look what would happen if we did bring up the pay. If we closed those pay gaps, we could, what we could do to reduce poverty and not only that, but we could add like over 500 billion into our economy here in the United States into the GDP. You know, we're under producing because we're not utilizing all of the human talent that we have. And what a loss for all of us. I think you bring up a really salient point because when you look at the Girl Scouts Research Institute study, it talks about the perception of leaders and who they are. And a lot has been said of the way that women lead and or the perception I should say of how women lead the descriptors are not always complimentary uh, there's the term bossy which we've all had discussions about and the way a lot of these descriptive these adjectives can deride women for being from being assertive or even just simply speaking out right and just speaking up um, when the same obviously can be applauded uh, when it comes to men. And so three in 10 girls said a fear of being bossy was a barrier for them in terms of taking on leadership roles. That's 30% of girls. And I feel like it's probably more than that when you really dig down deep into all of our concerns about this likability factor and, and all of the things that are expected, as, as you said, Anne, the energy that's expended on dealing with this stuff and fulfilling those things. Um, so Alicia, I wanna know, do you think, I mean, are women leaders finally being considered as the boss in a fair and equitable way rather than these terms that, like bossy? Um, I think, <sighs> You know, the, I want to answer the question and say yes. 
Yeah, right, right. I wanted to say absolutely, right? Um, the answer is no. I mean, I've, I've been, and this is, again, sharing my uh, experience, but also my experience with coffee shop talk and all the things with um, my women colleagues, my friends, my teammates, and um, women, time and time again, are not taken seriously without asserting themselves in a manner that they sometimes don't even need to. Like, why do I have to repeat myself? Why do I have to stand in a room and change the way that I would probably speak to my best friend so that you guys know that I mean business? I mean, it comes down to emails. You know, when you're writing an email and you put an exclamation point, when you say, good evening, exclamation point, and they're like, you know, you want them to take you seriously. So you put good evening, comma. And it's like, what? Listen, me addressing you in a way in which I'm excited to be here has nothing to do <laughs> with how serious you should be taking me and the expertise, again, that I have to bring to the table. Um, right. And I think, again, when I mentioned earlier about our men and our allies getting off the bench, that's where it starts. It starts with it not just being us trying to say, hey, take me serious. <laughs> Hello, do you remember when I was the one that taught you how to do X, Y, and Z? You know, and then all of a sudden they climb the ladder over you and they feel like, you know, they're inferior to you. I mean, sorry, superior to you because um, they are men and they're able to climb this ladder without all of that battle, without all of that fight to be taken seriously. Although our resume can look exactly the same. Um, and, you know, you even asking that question, it, it makes me like, wow, like I can't even answer it by saying, you know, what I want to say, I want to affirm that truth, but that's why we're here. You know, listening to Rochelle and Anne note, like it's validating to know it's important for us to say, you guys, we are here and we are shaking things up and we are saying, look at all of this that we can do. We know this visibility that for our young girls to see this and our young boys to see where we're at and what we're fighting for really does matter. 10 years time. So when you ask that question, the answer could be different. I hope so. I mean, Rochelle, do you think that, how close do you think we are? And I don't mean in measures of time, but more in steps of progress, given mm. what we've been through, what our society has both endured and experienced and hopefully learned from over the past few years. So I, th I think female leaders, you know, when they get to a leadership position, I think they are seen as competent and collaborative and courageous. Um, you know, I think they're challenging and changing the way leadership is defined. Mm -hmm. Boss, if you think about it, refers to a leadership role or a title. And bossy is used to describe how you do it, right? So girls and women who are ambitious should be celebrated. We should embrace our ambition and understand that we get to decide or determine how we lead in our families, our communities, and the workplace. You know, as we redefine leadership, it's not about a title or about doing, it's about being. Again, we, you know, leaders inspire others, as Anne said earlier, in support of a mission and around core values and common purpose. And, um, and, and I think over time, <laughs> you know, the leaders of today and the future, if we focus on how to be and how to develop quality and character, hopefully the term bossy will become obsolete. You know, when you have a woman in leadership, you're just acknowledging her competence and her intent, you know, because you have to lead with intent in order to, to lead, you know, transformational um, change in an organization. So it is my hope that, you know, my daughters won't even have to deal with the term bossy. Yeah, I think there's been, yeah, there's been so much discussion about banning bossy and terms like it, right? That That's just a representative term of all kinds of other great terms that we ju I just love. And so I, I think, and to build off of what Rochelle and Alicia are saying, um, we know that in this study too, that it was found that nearly all girls want an equitable workplace. And that would foster like the elimination of some of these terms and, you know, stereotypes that are so pervasive, right? Like we would hope. And so 
we want to talk about how how we all help all women rise up, including women of color, and what it means to address the dual issues of racial and gender bias in the workplace. So Anne, I'm going to start with you on this one. Where have you seen the encouraging evidence of improvement in terms of women in leadership in the last decade? I know we covered it a little bit, but like in your world, where have you seen it? Well, I've seen a lot of it in my world. Um, I look at Tucson right now. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Our, our mayor is a young Latina woman. She's dynamite. She was excellent leadership during this time of COVID. The head of the um, Girl Scouts, the head of the YWCA, the head of the Women's Foundation here are all young Latina, just really kickstart women. And I'm seeing them being recognized for who they are. In fact, I'm seeing people want them to be in all kinds of positions because they recognize how good they are. I think one of the things that we're talking about is we have to get rid of these preconceived biases that we have, even the unconscious bias. I mean, yeah. we want to hire people that look like us. or And and I think that's the problem with, with men hiring men over women a lot of times. It's just more comfortable. Um, and we have to just sort of kind of, you have to start looking at what's going to make your company work the best. What's going to be the best moving forward? And the evidence is clear. And, it, and it's really, really clear that women don't lead any worse, or sometimes they might even lead better than a lot of men. The reality is I think a lot of men in leadership didn't get there because they were stupendous. They got there because they were moved along ahead of other people that were women or people of color that, that were overlooked. And that may be a terrifying way to look at it, but I think it's true. Um, there's an awful lot of, you know, excellent, excellent skill and talent in, in each and every component in our, in, our, in our world. I can say right now that, you know, one just fact to keep at the front of your mind is that women have an enormous amount of economic clout right now. And I don't think that it's totally realized. Women are controlling right now 51% of the wealth in the United States. And a one third of the wealth worldwide. And if you start to think about what that could mean and how that could help promote change and how that's been promoting change, because women tend to, in many cases, support and move forward women, women's issues, justice, equality. Women are much more focused on social issues almost by nature. It's we've been allowed to. We've been it's been sort of given to us and we've always embraced it. So would men if they'd had that opportunity. I believe that. But I think we're at a we're at a point right now where we have to realize the power that we do have mm -hmm. and then make some of those harder decisions like being called bossy. You know, one of the things I had to decide years ago in leadership was that I would rather be respected than be liked. We all want to be liked. But I wanted to be respected, and that meant that I had to lead respectfully. I always had to be respectful and respectable. And it helped me in my leadership. You know, talking about the economic impact of women, it's we're in a pandemic. It even though things are improving, you know, there's a lot of uncharted territory ahead, right? And we know that so many moms are feeling squeezed by the pressure uh, and parenting and something that we cover at NBC News is how many women have dropped out of the workforce. And the latest stats show us that women have lost five and a half million jobs since the pandemic begin, began. 2.1 million women have left the labor force, meaning they're not looking for jobs or to be employed any longer. They have left the labor force and they're no longer in the unemployment stats that I cover every week or every month. So Alicia, knowing all of the challenges and then this added layer of kind of being driven out of the workforce, uh, basically, what do you think should happen as we navigate this moment? It's, it's a really intersectional problem. I mean, 
you know so much about what the challenges of pregnant women face. You've written about it extensively. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this just leads us to the question of what more needs to be done for women in the workplace. And it comes down to we need to acknowledge that motherhood, be it pregnancy, postpartum, beyond, is a normal part of life, <laughs> you know, and that space should be protected to allow mothers an opportunity to prioritize her overall health um, and trusting that this will allow her to return and be at her best. And like you mentioned, you know, this, this, is, this year was especially hard. And it's yeah. like kind of had a magnifying glass on all the mothers. You know, you're, you're saying women have been pushed out of the workforce, but why is that? Because a lot of women are also mothers. This has been almost impossible. And when we look at mothers in all professions, we've all been wronged by the structural and systemic failures that left all parents, but especially the mothers, overtaxed and overburdened. And we are now having to face and we're dealing with repercussions of that. And we're seeing mothers drop out, like you mentioned, of the workforce in record numbers. This leads me to, to exactly what we're fighting for. You know, what are this and exactly what Anne did with her company, her firm? You know, how are we seeing flexible work hours? How are we how are we making something this how are we making the workplace something that's equitable? I, in my own anecdote, was pushed out of my career or I clawed my way back into it after proving, I talked about this on CBS this morning with Gail King, after proving that I could come back in impossible circumstances. But why are we continuing to make moms work through impossible circumstances to prove themselves in the workplace? This just lets us know that we need to blow up these infrastructure or these, these ridiculous <laughs> uh, structures, um, entities, companies, brands, like all of these things that are creating more barriers. And because they're not listening, they're not learning. And as Anne mentioned, if we saw more women in leadership and you could see their capabilities of how they're able to bring up other people, you know, and they're able to be collaborative and we're able to open up this space in a way where we can work together, then I think that we wouldn't be facing a lot of the issues that we're facing right now because we can see okay, like one, if you see it, you can be it, but also not in a way where we have to, the struggle is already real, right? We don't need to escalate or, or magnify this struggle in a way that is not allowing us a place in where we can, um, we can, we can share everything that we do have to offer to the world. And I think one of the things I wanted to just make so that we could, I, I, I wanted to touch on is the example of what we're doing with Anne Mother, you know, where demonstrating what support systems could look like, where we want to provide practical solutions and ultimately turn that responsibility back on institutions to step up and support their, their, you know, their mothers who want to do both their career and their motherhood. And the limiting factor should not be parenthood when it is you choosing if you want to work in a certain field or not. I wanted to follow up by asking you about when you first realized that, was that around the time you did the New York Times, when you shared your Nike story with the world? Was that before that? Like, when did it hit you that, okay, wow, I'm not alone? Because I think a lot of women feel in this time of, you know, having a child, being pregnant, thinking about even getting pregnant, the career red flag goes up, right? Uh -huh. And you shared great uh -huh experience on that front and you were really open about it. Was that the watershed moment for you? Was it before then? Tell us a little bit more behind the scenes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, so I, I talked about this. It's um, what Joe's referring to as I did a New York Times op-ed um, co-written with the wonderful Lindsay Krauss at New York Times. And uh, we've been talking about this for about five years, just to give people background. And my wow. daughter is six and I just came out within 2019. So she was, you know, and, um, and it was a lot of, you know, not wanting to be pushed out of the workforce, not wanting companies to look at you as like, well, you know, that's something that you chose. And then looking for the examples of like, is it my fault? Is it my, is it, should yeah. I have known better? And um, coming and, and coming to understanding of like having these conversations and, and and like knowing, like deep down knowing, like 
this can't be for real. Like, where is everybody coming to our defenses? And wh why aren't people asking, you know, how can we help make this a place that's also equitable uh, for, for mothers in this, this industry, especially being in a business where your body is your business. And, you know, people mm -hmm. have way too much rain on what they say about it and what it does. Um, and I think that it was, it, again, like it was the conversation and talking about it and having somebody else pop in and say, oh, this happened to me too. And then you kind of saying like, well, well, what are we doing about it? Well, you know, this just is what it is. But no, it's not actually. Why is it what it is? It doesn't have to be this way. And, um, you know, again, having known that I came back into my sport, having won uh, a national title at six months postpartum, having ran the fastest time on my team at World Championships, winning a gold medal and breaking an American record at eight months postpartum, 10 months postpartum, and winning another national record. That's two national records, a national championship in just under a year. And this isn't to brag, and this isn't to say this is absolutely normal. It's to say this is the pressure that is put on women in the workforce, where it could be relatively impossible, and somehow we're still doing the impossible. But how do we make the impossible possible and also sane, where the health of the mother isn't um, at the detriment of, you know, every her, her longevity in her career? Hmm. Um, and and just here. talking about where I'm recognizing it, it is being within it, but it's also... And the, and the conversation factor, you know, so me recognizing like, what is it? Where did you, I recognize this happening? Uh, it was being within it, but also my role and the part about being a mother and recognizing how I want to change the landscape for my children is like, I don't want for my kids to be in this unnecessary hard spot. I want to have been able to have chipped away. Uh, this is what moms do too, right? This is why we are important in all of these roles is I want to have already chipped away at all of these things that were absolutely unnecessary and didn't obviously with what I was able to do in that year postpartum show what my capabilities were that ultimately had pretend barriers just because of what I added to myself, you know, and now we, we should be looking at motherhood as a value act. All of those things, those mm -hmm. perspectives, those things that we learn, how we want to help shape societies. Um, and again, the, the point is the conversations that I had helped me recognize it. It had me know that when I was 20, 21 years old, signing my first major contract coming out of college, I wasn't thinking about where motherhood was going to be a barrier in my career. And also, I guess part of me was also like, I don't think that it should be. I just expected it not to be. Yeah. And now I know it should not be, and I need to help change that landscape so that somebody isn't me coming into the peak of their career, but also thinking, yeah, let's add motherhood to it so that we can, like, take the kids with us while we go compete at the Olympics. And, and everybody else is the one telling you, actually, no, we don't want your motherhood here. It's a powerful story that has implications long into the future. And it's really remarkable you've been able to build this nonprofit organization to address these things head on in the same way that Rochelle and Anne are doing the same leadership work. And I want to know, Rochelle, what, what kind of support do you believe that women actually need right now to turn around this mass exodus from the workforce? So that's tough, right? So, you know, we talked about the sense of belonging um, yeah. because it's really important. So I don't, I don't think, and I think we have to bring awareness to the fact of this mass exodus. You know, I'm a mom of five, so I can relate to the pressures that have been put on families during the pandemic. But we have to understand that when fewer mothers participate in the labor force, or when they reduce their work hours from full-time to part-time, whether by choice or circumstance, the result means less money for the household. And it's particularly troublesome for lower income families. Right. The impacts of, yeah, so the impacts of this disruption up to women's ability to work is enormous. In fact, the maternal labor force participation um, has been increasing kind of steadily, slowly over time, but even a 5% decline would undo the past 25 years of progress. You know, and so I think, mm -hmm. you know, the work that Alicia is doing is really important. I don't have, you know, a panacea for like, how do we stop it? How do we get them back right. again? 
other than I, I really do admire the DEI work that a lot of institutions are doing. You know, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important. And hopefully, understanding that cultures of institutions internally, you know, are changing, that will, you know, welcome women back into the workforce or encourage them to step back in, you know, after, you know, after leaving it um, in such a short period of time. I have one last question for Anne on that front. Do you think the pandemic and all that everyone has been through, plus the set of issues we've talked about in this panel, contribute to everybody, including men, being able to say, okay, for those who are fortunate enough to be able to work from home or to have increased flexibility, and those who are less fortunate who are still going out to work, right? They have the less flexibility fortune, that maybe there's more hope. I'm always hopeful, but that that's what keeps me going. That's what also keeps me awake at night are these issues. I think that the pandemic has uncovered a lot of the problems that most of us knew we were, th were there, but we didn't have to face them on a daily basis, although mm -hmm. many people do have to. I think our whole country has had to face these on a daily basis. Um, I don't, I mean, I think children going back to school and having the schools be safe will help in some ways, but I think it also shows not just the injustice due to race and gender and other pieces, but also that there needs to be, you know, um, access to health care, but also access to child care. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a strong proponent for child care most of my life. If you, if companies could, every company I have ever known um, that that really put some funding into child care facilities for the company um, have, has excelled, excelled beyond what they would have ever expected. So you're, you're looking at how do you keep men and women because men, many men would like to be more uh, more caregivers than they can, but they can't ever you know get that role if who's who's going to support the family if it's a if it's a dual parent family. But regardless, if we want people to have the opportunity to work and we want to increase our gross domestic product and we want to be a fair and equitable country, we're going to have to offer the things that that needs. You know, safe um, cultures to work within that that recognize and reward hard work and skill and talent, but also some of the basics like you know general health care and and justice and child care. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to child care over and over again to allow women the opportunity to continue to be in the workforce on this. We have a lot of questions from the audience and Rochelle and Alicia. Um, and so we're going to get started with those. Um, the first question is, have any of you suffered from imposter syndrome? And what is your best advice for young professionals in the first few years of their careers to overcome it? And I will start with Alicia. Um, I don't believe I've suffered from imposter syndrome. Um, and I will say that I've had um, great women examples that have been like, show up as yourself. I mean, you're going to you're going to get faced with people who don't like it, you know, when you're fighting for your rights. But at the same time, that does matter because it's what we're talking about that conversation starter it's the visibility piece it's people also recognizing okay i'm not the only one that thinks this way um and that you know believes that uh, we should have this space to um, be our full selves at work in a place where we are our experiences are validated where um, we are practicing empathy um and where we are cared for as we care for other people in a collaborative way and so um so I will say that's kind of been my back of my mantra, or maybe it's the forefront of my mind where I'm just like, you know, I'm walking here and I'm, I know I belong in this space. And, and, and I did have, I think I just shared with the New York Times off that I did have the, is my experience valid in me thinking that this isn't right um, more than an imposter sort of 
sin- mm-hmm. syndrome. But again, having these women surrounding me in a place where I could share these experiences and then also they them sharing their experiences helps me recognize like it's really important for me to show up as I am and to be um, open in sharing my experiences in order to make make things better. Rochelle, have you experienced imposter syndrome either at the FBI or prior? I would have to say it is about mindset. So like many women, I am a perfectionist and I don't like to engage in anything unless I know I can do it really well. So um, so there are times where I have been in the workplace and taken on a task because I'm the first one to raise my hand, you know, when there's a, a task to be done. But like Alicia said, if you show up every day as your authentic self, it is take it or leave it. And I've been just very lucky that they've been more takers than leavers. But I think if you show up every day as yourself and you're, you have a learning mindset and you're inclusive and you bring people along with you, I, I think the imposter syndrome, it's almost a misnomer. I think you have to believe in yourself you know, and you're, and you know that you're competent and qualified and Mm -hmm. regardless of what everybody else in the room might be thinking at any given moment in time, you know, be a true leader. And it's not about a title and it's not about a, a position, but rather it is about being in a space where you're appreciated and people want to follow you. You know, that's what leadership is about. And I think with that mindset, I, so I, I can say that I haven't had that that feeling, but um, it's because of the mindset I bring to every experience. Anne, what do you think? I have had that feeling. I have. I've been invited to sit at a lot of very, at, at tables I never really imagined myself wanting to be at or being at. And and I think that what helped me and helps me all all along um, is that there's a reason someone asked me to be there. Yep. And I had the, the added, um, both, both the wonder and the good and the, and the challenge of, of running a foundation. So sometimes you wonder, are they inviting me here because there's money in the bucket or are they inviting me here because of me? But it doesn't take very long to find out the answer to that move beyond the bucket if that's you know not the necessary part but you're most often invited to a table because of what you have to bring and we've got to remember that you know we really have to remember that there's a reason you're there it's because of who you are and what you have to bring and share well that kind of answers one of the questions that we got in the chat box which is do you see more power in coaching our girl scouts to express their own voice and continue to fight to be heard or adapt to the current power structure to be heard and i think i think i see an agreement there is is for the former um more value in expressing your own voice i wanted to ask a question about motherhood here since we all have this in common all four of us um, another question is when fewer mothers are part of the decision making force in any business motherhood and parenthood is left out of the big picture uh, from products to work policies which we've talked a little bit about here so how do we keep moving forward to place more mothers in those big decision making roles at the workplace alicia i'll start with you my empty and um, oh my goodness you know yeah that's the question right um but also i think i think what we one we've been talking a lot about this is is breaking down um these self-perpetuating myths you know that feed the stereotype that sets so much in motion the decisions made of women and their careers whether or not they choose to have children you know that's where it needs to change we just need these policies to be like a woman could never choose to have a child but this policy would be still protecting if that is something that comes uh, into play in her life uh, her evolution of self and then how we need to also look at how younger women view motherhood as an n uh, as an or sorry or an and you know um, it doesn't have to be either or, we, and, and otherwise called and mothers because we believe that. 
include Belize, you know, I'm Alicia Montano. I am a fighter of truth. I'm a groundbreaker. I am a champion and mother. I don't have to be or any of those things. Um, and we also need to just recognize these invisible barriers that include the reality of having your livelihood cut from your livelihood cut from underneath you, you know, and and then you're asking like, how do I um, climb the ladder? How do I better myself within my career track without any financial backing to pay for childcare? Like Ann has talked about, that should be something that companies are looking at changing within it within uh, the the workplace. And right now, you know, like we mentioned, we're seeing what happens to working mothers when the childcare is taking away and women are forced out of the workforce. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, when we, when, when we look at the big picture, when we look at the big picture, and I mentioned this earlier, so I guess I'm kind of repeating myself, but when we look at the big picture and we look at the number of people in the world, <laughs> we have, um, and in the workforce, we have over, I think we have over, is it 48% of women have been um, in the workforce. So think about that number kind of being taken, that are mothers, sorry. So think about that amount of women being taken out of it. Um, I'm kind of missing that last part of your question that I want to make sure that I answered. Uh, Joe, could you ask, ask it one more time? Yes, yeah, so how do we put more mothers in that top tier of leadership? Because obviously it affects the products yeah. that we buy and sell and right. obviously the policies. Right. Right. And that's what I was. Yes, exactly. So we just have to break down the visibility of motherhood and it being the career killer um, and that knowing that there's more to the story of why women don't come back to uh, the workforce. And it isn't because, you know, they're not capable. It's because we haven't we don't have the structures in place that allow for her to now take care of her family um, as well as um uh, you know, progress in her career. So, um, you know, our organization, again, is aiming to break down the, the barriers of this whole notion that it's either or. And we do need help to uh, think through what it could look like. We do need to help share the visibility of motherhood so people know that this also exists in that space. I mean, li li literally, I was getting goosebumps listening to Rochelle because I 100% am like, Wow, like I don't think I saw um, a mother of five, you know, a mother, let alone a mother of five in the Intel space in the FBI. Like I, I'm like, and to me, I'm, fight, I'm fighting for these spaces. And I, I'm so thrilled to be actually in this conversation, but it matters because I'm like, I want to connect with Rochelle. I'm like, I need her to email me after. We need to talk more about this because us seeing more women in different roles helps us understand that that they can, m women, sorry, let's just be clear, mothers in different roles helps us understand like we can be there too and I can have both of those. I don't have to pick either or and I can believe in myself and in my dreams and I don't have to say, man, I have to let this one die because I want this one. Rochelle? I agree with you wholeheartedly. I say we, don't accept the or, and it's it's and, 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 until you're doing all those things. So when you come to the workplace, you are your most authentic self, and you bring so much more life experience and, you know, diversity of thought to decisions that are being made. But I think the most important thing we've got to remember as female leaders is on this journey, which is you know, similar to that of others, we've got to bring other women along with us. And we've got to shift, you know, the attitudes about motherhood and women in the workplace and until we get to the point where it's commonplace. And I I'll leave you with a closing thought. Well, I, I agree wholeheartedly with both. Um, and I would have to say that when I was first invited to be on the Women's Leadership Board at the Kennedy School at Harvard, I went to my very first meeting and and was you know networking and wandering around and and excited and a little nervous because it was all brand new. And we all sat down and they said, "Oh, you know, we have questions for all the new the new recently you know inducted members, and we're going to start alphabetically by first names." Um, and tell us your greatest skill. 
and I was the first person, of course, as Anne, and I had to get up and I said, time management, because I've raised six children. Yeah. And my time management skills are above and beyond almost anyone else's. Any mother that's able to work, that's raising, even, even if you're at home and you're raising children, your time management skills, how many different pieces you are keeping track of, when then Bobby has to go to track, when Susie has to do this, you become so good at it that it's it's such an add to any business or any position you could be in. It's it's absolutely incredible. Well, Anne, Rochelle, Alicia, thank you so, so much. I wish we could have another hour together, but our time is up. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you all for being with us. And with that, I'm going to toss it back to Kim with Girl Scouts USA. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you all so much. And thank you everyone on the line for inviting the Girl Scout Network into your homes. You, as I'm sure you already know, the Girl Scout cookie program is a very exciting part of the Girl Scout experience. And whether Girl Scouts are going door to door, setting up booths or selling cookies online, they're preparing for a bright future as business leaders or entrepreneurs. And you can support Girl Scouts by buying cookies at the link we're sharing in the log. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening, and we look forward to welcoming you back at our next event. We'll be hosting a wide variety of campfire chats, so be sure to stay up to date with our offerings on girlscouts.org backslash campfire chats. With that, we wish you all a very good night, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and we will see you at our next event.